Hello, I'm Jacqueline Polliff, and today I'm going to present an overview of the harp. The harp is an instantly recognizable instrument, but I find that when I'm out performing, many people, both audience members and other musicians, have questions about the harp. Some people want to know more about how you play the harp, and many, many people want to know how a harp works. We'll start with um, a few general considerations about playing. Then I'll talk about the strings of the harp. Uh, next, we'll go over the structure of the harp. And then finally, we'll talk about the mechanical aspects of the instrument. In some ways, a harp is a really simple instrument. It's basically just a frame with strings. And you make sound by plucking the strings. Harps are particularly known for rolled chords, arpeggios, and glissandos, or glisses. The harp is made to be played while seated. So most people sit on some sort of um, adjustable bench or stool so that they can get the height right where they want it. And then you pull the harp back and rest it on your right shoulder. Harps are built to do this. There's kind of a balance point, so it's not heavy when it's resting there. And then you want your harp to face out to the audience so that all of the sound goes directly out to them. When you play, you use on both hands your um, thumb and your first three fingers, but never your pinky, your little finger. So it's uh, eight fingers total, both thumbs and the first three fingers. And all of the sound, with the exception of a few special effects, is made just with the very tip of your finger on the string. That's how you create the sound. So you have to keep your nails really short so that they don't get in the way, and your fingers build up um, a little bit of a callus over time. For the playing position on the harp, your hands are parallel. In both hands, the thumb is up top, and then you have the three fingers down below. Harp music looks quite similar to piano music. You read the grand staff, both the treble and the bass clef. And generally, your right hand plays up here in the higher notes in the treble clef, and your left hand plays down here, the lower notes or the bass clef. When you're playing with music, you take your music stand and you set it um, just here to the left. That way you can look at the strings or glance over at your music quite easily. It makes kind of a nice back and forth. Harps come in a surprisingly wide array of sizes. Everything that I've been uh, showing you so far has been using this harp, my personal harp, which is the largest possible size of harp. For contrast, let's look at this small harp. This is one of the smallest possible sizes of harps. As you can see, I'm just holding it in my lap. And whenever we talk about specific instruments, there are a number of different ways that we can categorize them, but we start by splitting all harps into two categories. You can have lever harps and you can have pedal harps. This one is a lever harp because as you can see, each string has a lever attached to the top of it. If we go back to my personal harp for a moment, you can see that down around the base, there are pedals, foot pedals. So this one does not fall into the category of lever harp, but instead is a pedal harp. Both the levers and the pedals are complex systems. They're used to create chromaticism, sharps and flats on the harp. And we'll talk about how they work really in depth a little bit later on when we discuss the mechanics of the harp. But for right now, the important point to remember is just that harpists always separate harps into two different categories, lever harps like this one and pedal harps like this one. If you want to be a bit more specific when talking about what kind of harp you have, then what you do is you refer to the name of the harp maker and the name of the harp model. This is a Heartland Lyra. Heartland is the name of the harp maker, and Lyra is the specific model. And this harp over here is a Lion and Healy Style 30. I have a third harp here that I wanted to show. This one is also a lever harp, like the Lyra in my lap, because as you can see, there's a lever at the top of each string. But obviously, it's much larger than this Lyra. This is a Lion and Healy Troubadour 4. So it's made by Lion & Healy, the same company that, um, that made my Style 30. 
And between the two sizes of lever harps that I showed you, the little tiny lira and this one here, there are all kinds of sizes in between. This brings us to the last way that we categorize harps, and that's by size. So for example, I could describe this harp here as being um, a five foot, about a five foot tall harp with 36 strings. And I could take this Heartland Lyra here, and I could describe this one as being about three, foot, three feet tall and having 25 strings. This one you could say is about six feet tall. It has 47 strings, which is a range of six and a half octaves, just smaller than that of a piano. And as I mentioned before, this is the largest possible size of harp. Harps don't come with more than 47 strings. I should also say that all of these different sizes don't necessarily uh, correspond to the height of the player. So of course, if you were five years old, you could not play a harp this large. It would kind of dwarf you and overwhelm you. But the inverse does not hold true. If you're an adult and you want to play a little tiny harp, that's perfectly fine. The different sizes are just to give people a lot of options. Next, we're going to talk about the strings on the harp. Obviously, the strings are crucially important because they're what makes sound. Of course, the longer strings make the lower pitches, and the shorter strings make the higher pitches. The strings themselves are laid out in the order of a scale. So just like with any instrument, we use the first seven letters of the alphabet to uh, name our pitches, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You could also call them Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si. And um, I'm sure you've noticed that the strings are color-coded. This is as a visual reference. So the red string here is the letter C. When I glance over, I can easily find it, the red string. Then it's followed by D and E, the next notes of our scale. Then when we come to the F, Again, it's color-coded. The Fs are always either black or blue. And then we have G, A, and B. And then our scale repeats again and again in each octave. Part of playing the harp is tuning the harp. Each string must be tuned individually. The strings wind at the top around a little metal piece called a tuning pin, which goes through the wood of the harp onto the back side. And on that back side, you can attach a tool called a tuning key to each pin individually. And this just works as a wrench. It allows you to turn the tuning pin a little bit and either wind the string up slightly more or unwind it a tiny bit. And that in turn raises or lowers the pitch of the string. Most harpists use an electronic tuner or a tuning app to help them in their tuning because this tells you exactly when the string is in tune. I would say that a lot of students, when they first start out, maybe tune their harps once a week. Um, tuning, of course, is a skill. You get much more efficient at it the more that you do it. I can tune this entire harp in a little less than five minutes. And I tune it at least every day. And um, every time you move a harp, you have to tune it again. The strings themselves can be made out of three different materials. You can have nylon strings, which are a synthetic material. You can have uh, gut strings, which are in fact all natural animal gut. I think usually they use cow gut. And then there are um, metal strings. These are usually uh, steel at the core and then wound with metal around the outside. Most harpists refer to the metal strings as wire strings. Different harps use different combinations of these strings. A lot of lever harps um, have maybe all nylon strings or sometimes mostly nylon strings and a few wire strings. Um, some of them use gut, but that's a little bit less common. Pedal harps typically have uh, wire or metal strings at the very base. And then the majority of the strings uh, might be gut and then just a few nylon strings at the very top. No matter how carefully you care for your harp, or no matter what kind of string that you use, any string can break at any time. Professional harpists therefore carry around a whole set of extra strings so that they're ready for any unexpected breaks and can just replace a string right then and there. Um, replacing a broken string is a skill just like tuning, so of course the more you do it, the better you get at it. The basic process is that you take your length of new string and tie a knot in the bottom, then you thread it up through the back of the harp. There are access holes back here and then you wind it around the tuning pin. 
As a professional harpist, I also replace my entire set of strings at least once a year to keep the strings themselves in really top-notch condition. Let's talk about the structure of the harp next. This vertical piece of wood here is called the column of the harp. Some people also call it the pillar, and it's really important for the stability of the frame. Then we have this big piece here. I guess it looks kind of like a swoosh. <laughs> That's called either the neck of the harp, or some people also call it the harmonic curve. And you can see a metal plate with a lot of uh, moving parts on top of it. That's called uh, either the action or the mechanism of the harp. And all of that is very important for the mechanical aspects of the instrument, which we'll talk about in great detail shortly. And over here we have this small and strangely shaped piece of wood. That's called the knee block, knee like the joint, because that piece of wood is in fact just a joint. It joins the neck with the body of the harp. The body is just this rounded piece that wraps around the back of the harp. It's completely hollow, and its purpose is to act as a resonating chamber for the sound when you play. You can also see these um, holes in the back of the body. I mentioned those earlier. You use those to access the strings when you're replacing strings. The body of the harp connects to the soundboard, this flat piece of wood here on either side. The soundboard is important as it projects the sound out. And finally, here is the bottom section of the harp. Now, if you have a lever harp, it is not this complex <laughs> when you get down to the bottom of the harp. But this is called the bass, this whole piece here. This horizontal piece that sits on top of it is the bass board, and most lever harps just come down to the bass board and stop. Then we have these little pieces that stick out here and here. Those are the feet of the harp. And finally, you can see a few of the pedals. Besides all of the parts of the harp that we went over, which are pretty standard, there's a lot harp makers can do sort of with extra touches to give their harps or the different models a distinctive look. So for one thing, there's the finish of the instrument. Generally, once a harp is completed, the harp maker will stain it a variety of colors. There's also um, designs that can be carved into the column and the base in particular, sometimes little geometric patterns or maybe flowers. You can also do a gold leaf finish, again, particularly on the column and the base for that particular look. And all of these things are really visually appealing, but they don't affect the sound of the instrument, either, either negatively or positively. Finally, we're going to talk about the mechanics of the harp. When I play a scale like this on the harp, it's a diatonic scale. There are no sharps, no flats that would be just like all of the white keys on the piano. So the problem of chromaticism, of how to create sharps and flats, has been a problem for the ages with the harp. And harp makers have tried a lot of different solutions over the centuries, but the idea of levers has been around and thriving for a long time. So if we use this F as an example, if I play it with the lever disengaged, it sounds like this. Then if I go ahead and engage the lever, the sound changes, it becomes a little bit higher. And from a mechanical standpoint, what's happening is that the lever is pinching the string, so it's shortening the vibrating length of the string, and the shorter the string, the higher the pitch. In musical terms, this is an F, and this is an F sharp. Each of these levers is a half step lever. They can raise the pitch by a half step or a semitone. On a lever harp with a full set of levers, that is one lever per string, you can play in eight different keys. And which eight keys you can play in depends on how you tune your harp. Most serious lever harpists tune their harp in the key of E flat with three flats. So then when the levers are disengaged, some of the strings are flat and some of the strings are natural. And depending on how you set your levers, those eight keys then would be C, F, B flat, E flat, G, D, A, and E. For many styles of music, particularly different types of folk music, only being able to play in eight keys is perfectly sufficient. So if you were to go see a professional folk harpist or a professional Celtic harpist perform, they would perform on a lever harp. Most students start off by playing a lever harp. Some stick with a lever harp for their entire careers. For others, if they're interested in playing um, you know, complex classical music 
or just music with a lot of chromaticism and using a lot of different keys, at a certain point they find that they need to switch to a pedal harp. The reason for this switch is that over time it became clear that the lever harp wasn't able to keep up with other orchestral instruments. There are three main drawbacks. One drawback is that you have to move the levers with your left hand. So that means that you might be playing along and then you have to stop playing with your left hand and reach up and change a lever. And this can be really awkward. Even if your right hand keeps playing, sometimes there's kind of a hole in the music where your left hand has you know, dropped out. The second drawback is that you have to change each lever individually. So if you're in the key of C and you want to go to the key of G where you add an F sharp, you have to move each F lever for all of the F strings individually and that takes a lot of time. And then of course the final drawback is that you can only play in eight keys. You cannot play in all of the keys. So what some clever harp makers did was they kept the lever mechanism, the mechanism of pinching the strings to shorten them but they connected it to pedals down around the base of the harp. So they connected all of the mechanism inside the harp and then they put these long rods in the column. The column of a pedal harp is always hollow and then those rods in turn connected to the foot pedals around the base of the harp. And this was great because right off it solved the first of our difficulties. If you can control the pinching mechanism, the lever mechanism up here with your feet, you can keep playing with both hands and have your feet change the pitch of the strings at the same time. There were a few more steps to refine this new mechanical process on the harp. One of the first problems was that of physical space. On the lever harp, you have a lever per string, and on the pedal harp, each string still has its own individual mechanism, but you cannot then in turn connect the individual mechanisms to individual pedals. Even if you had a slightly smaller pedal harp than this, say with 44 strings, you could not have 44 pedals around the base of the harp. There's no physical way to fit that many pedals on a harp. What harp makers did was to connect each pedal to an entire group of strings rather than to individual strings. And the obvious way to do this was by the pitch or the letter. So they took all of the C strings and connected them to the same pedal. And then there's a pedal that controls the pinching mechanism for all of the D strings simultaneously, and so forth and so on. There are seven pitches per octave, C, D, E, F, G, A, and B. So there are seven pedals around the base of the harp. This also solves the second difficulty, which is that it took a long time to modulate because you had to move each lever individually, you know, all of the Fs one at a time. So now if we were in the key of C and we wanted to modulate to the key of G, you just have to move one pedal and all of the Fs have changed to sharp and your entire harp is now in the key of G. Finally, and this last change took quite some time to come about, pedal harp makers came up with the idea of what is essentially adding a second row of levers to all of the strings. If you remember on the lever harp, there were two choices per string, the sound with the lever disengaged or with the lever engaged. But in the pedal harp, they went ahead and added another row of the pinching mechanism. So rather than just two choices per string, now you have three choices per string. Let's go ahead and use this D string right here as an example. So right now, the string is in its longest position. It's vibrating from here on down to the base of the string. And if I play it, it sounds like this. If I go ahead and move the pedal, pinch the string, so you'll see this first disc here, our pinching mechanism fully rotate and pinch the string right here. That has shortened the string and raised the sound. If I move the pedal again, this disc will finish rotating fully and now the string is pinched right here, shortening it even further. In musical terms, we have a D flat, a D natural, and a D sharp. Those are the three positions of each string, flat, natural, and sharp. And this is really exciting because it solved our third and final problem. On the lever harp, you could only play in eight keys, but with each string having three positions rather than two, now you can play in all of the keys. Of course, this approach to chromaticism is a little bit strange because then we physically have a D sharp and an E flat on separate strings. A D sharp and an E flat always sound the same. 
and on most instruments you play them the exact same way too. Here they still sound the same, but you physically play them differently. And the nice thing about having this, all these um, enharmonics, equivalents kind of built into the harp, is that that's how we can play so many beautiful glissandos, because you can double up some of the pitches of your strings and play something like a pentatonic glissando. You might be wondering how all of this looks from the base of the harp. So here we have the seven pedals. You can see that there are three on the left side, which are controlled by the left foot, and four on the right side, which are controlled by the right foot. The order of the pedals is a little bit strange, but here it is. Going from left to right, we have D, C, B, and then E, F, G, and A. You can see that each pedal has three different notches. Those are for the three different positions of the string, and you can lock the pedal in. If we use the C pedal here for an example, right now, all of the C strings are in flat. Then if I move the pedal down and lock it into its notch, they become natural. And then if I move it down again and lock it into its notch, they become sharp. And all of the pedals work that way. The three notches are the same, flat, natural, and sharp. Many people find that the position of the notches are opposite of what they want. They would like sharp to be the topmost and flat to be the bottommost but the pedals match the positions of the string, and that's how we came up with the system. Most people don't realize quite how complex it is, but on the pedal harp, there are over 2,000 moving parts within this system. In conclusion, I hope that you found all of this information helpful, and maybe you understand a bit more now about how the harp is played and how the instrument itself functions. If you're considering learning to play the harp, then naturally I want to encourage you to do so and just wish you luck in all of your endeavors with the harp.